Thanks. Thanks to the Linda Hall Library, to the alumni associations, um, and to all of you for coming out tonight. Not long ago, I sat down with my teenage daughter to watch the classic movie, All the President's Men. It's a story of two Washington Post reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, and their investigation, which started by looking into a uh, seemingly minor robbery and ended up uh, leading all the way to the Oval Office and uh, resulting in the resignation of President Nixon. Uh, and the movie is a narrative of their investigation into these events. Uh, at one point in the story, there's a bit of drama around uh, a particular question that they wanted to be able to answer, and that is, who is Kenneth Dahlberg? They had discovered a document that contained the name Kenneth Dahlberg, and they believed that this man, whoever he was, had something to do with whatever it was they were investigating, and they needed to find him. But all they knew was the name, and the fact that he had something to do with the Republican Party. So finding this guy was a big challenge, and the movie makes a bunch of drama out of it. Now, these people, of course, Washington Post reporters, this is the Washington Post, and these are world-class experts at finding information and finding people. And yet, for them, it was a big challenge to find Kenneth Dahlberg. Eventually, of course, they did find Kenneth Dahlberg. Here's the real Kenneth Dahlberg. And although it turned out that Mr. Dahlberg himself had done nothing wrong, he had information that was valuable to the investigation and that led eventually through a series of steps to the result. Now, my daughter, my teenage daughter, was a little bit mystified by this because she couldn't understand why it would be hard to answer the question, who is Kenneth Dahlberg? I mean, if you want to find Kenneth Dahlberg, it's easy. You go to Google, you type Kenneth Dahlberg Republican, you click on the first link, it's Kenneth Dahlberg's Wikipedia page, it tells you all about him, where he lives, and how to find him. No problem. So what had been a big challenge just a generation earlier was now child's play. Something had poor, important had changed about our world. And what had changed was that we had gone through a historic transition from a world of information scarcity in which our main problem was finding the information we needed to a world of information abundance in which our main problem is sorting through all of the, um, uh, all of the avalanche of information that is available to us. This is a historic shift, and it's one that's happening right now. And I believe this is one of the most important shifts in the human experience that has happened in our entire history. I think it's up there with the advent of writing. The first, um, uh, the, the advent of writing which made it possible for us to record information and store it and read it back later or to pass it from one person to another to create a library. It's up there with the printing press which allowed us to mass produce stored information cheaply and make it available to the masses. It's up there with the telegraph, which for the first time made it possible for information to travel much more quickly than a person or a thing could travel. This world, this change to information abundance is a fundamental change in the way that we experience information and therefore in the way that we experience the world. Now when I talk about information abundance, what I mean is the huge amount of information that's being recorded and stored every day. Trillions of gigabytes of information that are stored. And much of this is information about people. And when you're talking about trillions of gigabytes of information, and by the way, that doubles every couple of years. Think about that. The amount of new information recorded by the human race in the next two years or so will be equal to what we've recorded in our entire history up to this point. Literally doubling the information we have stored every couple years. And when most of that information is about people, then we get to some very serious issues of privacy. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. The ways in which this fundamental shift in our experience to a world of information abundance is affecting our privacy and how we should think about what that means and how we can cope with it. 
Now, I've spent the last several years of my career mostly working on this issue. I've worked on it in the academic setting in, at Princeton, but I've also worked on it in other settings. I've worked on it, for example, at the Federal Trade Commission, where I was the first uh, chief technologist for a couple years. The FTC is the main federal agency which is dealing with issues of consumer privacy. I've dealt with it as well back at the university uh, in talking about um, what we've learned in the last couple years about the activities of government in collecting information. For example, we've seen stories about the National Security Agency collecting phone records about virtually every phone call in the United States, so-called phone metadata. Now, you might think if you are not versed in the world of today's computer technology that a database containing information about every single phone call made every single day in the United States, that that was a big data set. But by today's standards, that's actually a small data set. No problem. I could probably fit that on my laptop. It used to be a big challenge to record and analyze information about every single phone call made in the United States, but now it's child's play. And that change also affects the way we think about the role of our government and the relationship between us as citizens and law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And that's an issue that I've dealt with both in my academic writing and also in testifying before Congress. So this change from information security to information abundance means that the capabilities of government, whether it's a benign government or whether it's a repressive government, change fundamentally. It's now possible, for example, to record every single phone call made in the United States. That's feasible today to record it all, to store it all, and to put it all in a giant database which is searchable. That's what information abundance could do. And so we, for the first time, need to think about how we're going to manage the possibility that that can happen, and whether we want it to, uh, to allow it to happen, and what the law should say about it. Um, tremendous abundance of information and information about people. So I want to talk tonight about the implications of this for privacy. And I want to focus on two main questions. First, what is privacy? And second, how can we, what, what is privacy? And second, how can we protect it? But let me talk first about this question of what is privacy. Now, one way of thinking about privacy, and one that is embedded in a lot of our current law, in a lot of the way that we talk about privacy, is the idea that privacy amounts to protecting identifying information. So we're going to take all the information out in the world and we're going to divide it into information that is identifying information and information that is not. For example, if I'm wearing a name tag, it says, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. That says, that is identifying information because that's my name. If I'm wearing a name tag that says, hello, my social security number is 0780511120, and I should just say, uh, by the way, that the information that I say about myself in this lecture, is uh, much of it is not true. This, for example, is not my actual social security number. This is a number the Social Security Administration says you should use in ads and demonstrations. <laughs> but this also, if it were true, would be identifying information about me. The Social Security number is held to be identifying information, and the law mostly protects identifying information and says it has to be handled specially, that we're supposed to be notified as uh, consumers or citizens if identifying information is leaked in certain settings, and so on. So the law draws this line between identifying information and non-identifying information. So non-identifying information under current legal statuses includes the information that isn't on a list of particular items. For example, this is not identifying information, a photograph. I mean, who knows who that guy is? <laughs> but nowadays, with facial recognition, it's not just Barack Obama, but it's you and me who can be identified from an individual photo. Companies and researchers have demonstrated that with a, a phone cam photo of pretty much any person on the street, there's a good likelihood that they can figure out exactly who that person is by looking at public data sources and correlating the photos that are available. If you're curious about this, you might try just going to Google and doing images.google.com and searching for your own name. Odds are pretty decent that there's a photo of you that will show up and software exists that can match a fresh photo to those photos online. So a picture of a face is, in practice, identifying information, but legally, mostly not. So that's one problem with this idea of identifying information. But another problem is that many of the most sensitive kinds of information that we want to protect about ourselves is not 
identifying information and therefore not always strongly protected under current law. For example, if I were to walk around wearing a name tag that said, hello, I'm diabetic, that is sensitive medical information, and yet it's not identifying information. And frankly, if I were diabetic, I would rather walk around with a name tag with my name on it than a name tag like this. Or, hello, I keep exotic reptiles. <laughs> or, hello, I ate a cupcake for breakfast today. <laughs> or, hello, I don't believe that God created the world in seven literal days. Or, hello, I have a tattoo of Justin Bieber. <laughs> Any one of these things I would consider more sensitive, if true, than, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, right, with this respect to this one, um, more sensitive than my name, and in some cases more sensitive than my social security number. And yet we have this idea that it's only identification that is important, and that seems not to be right. So maybe we need a different idea of privacy. And while I could go on at great length about definitions of privacy, I've been to academic conferences that do nothing but argue about the definition of privacy. But for our purposes tonight, let's go with this definition. The privacy is about the right to tell some people information and not others. Because clearly there's information we have that's very sensitive that we might want to tell to our doctor, to our lawyer, to a counselor, to our family, to our close friends that we don't want to tell to the general public. And so if we're going to have an operating definition of privacy, this is as good a one as any. And so let's say privacy is the right to tell some people information but not others. And let's go on and talk about how can we protect in privacy. And this is a particularly hard question to answer in a world with widespread information technology. So what do we mean by privacy? Well, maybe something like control over who learns which facts about you. How can we do this? How can we effectively have control over who can learn which facts about us? Well, one approach we can take, one plan, is to say we're not going to reveal sensitive facts. I'm just not going to tell you if I'm diabetic or ate a cupcake for breakfast today or have a Justin Bieber tattoo. And by not telling you those things, I'll be able to prevent you from knowing them. The problem with this plan of not revealing sensitive facts is that it doesn't actually work in practice. And the reason it doesn't actually work is the problem of inference. And that is that um, if you know some facts about me, you can use those to infer other facts. And so here's a very simple example of inference. If I were to tell you that Ed lives in Princeton, you could infer from that that Ed lives in New Jersey. Another fact related to the first one, which follows logically from it. And so when I reveal that Ed lives in Princeton, I'm also implicitly revealing that Ed lives in New Jersey. Or for example, if I reveal to you that Ed teaches at Princeton University, it's a pretty good bet that Ed has a PhD. Not certain, but pretty good bet. So the nature of inference is that if I tell you one fact, it implies another fact. And if that second fact implies a third one, and if those second and third facts in turn imply a fourth one, then we can unleash a whole chain of inferences by revealing just one fact. If we reveal the first fact up here, we're in, we're in actuality revealing all of these other facts. And so this problem of inference means that if I want to keep something secret from you, it's not enough to avoid revealing to you that one thing I want to keep secret. I also need to protect a kind of perimeter of, a, that, that exists logically around the thing that I want to protect. Uh, and this problem of inference, as we'll see, is very slippery. It's very difficult to understand what might be inferred from the facts that are publicly available about you. Now, if we're going to think rigorously, carefully about inference, we're going to need to construct a detailed theory. And, and researchers have done this. It involves mathematical logic. It involves Bayesian analysis and all kinds of complicated math and science stuff. But you don't want to hear about that stuff. That's scary. Let me instead use an analogy that will help us sort of understand a little bit about how inference works and what the dynamics of inference are like, the ways in which inference about information can be surprising and difficult to, put, to get our hands around intellectually. And the analogy that I want to use is an analogy to a simpler form of formal reasoning, and that is algebra. Algebra, which in our memory is not represented by the scary Frankenstein monster, but represented by our high school algebra teacher. <laughs> this is my daughter's actual high school algebra teacher. <laughs> and so what I want you to do is think by analogy that uh, about someone who wants to infer a particular fact about you or me. 
Um, and the analogy is that the fact that the person is trying to figure out is the value of some variable x, right? Remember that high school algebra teacher always telling you to find x. So here x is the fact that we want to infer. And now I'm going to tell you some facts that relate to x. And I'm going to ask you, when can you infer what x is? So I'll tell you one fact about x. Here's a fact about x, that x minus y equals 2. OK, now if you know this, you've learned something about x. And now what values might x possibly take on if we know this thing? Well, actually, x can take on absolutely any value. So we've learned something useful about x, and yet we haven't narrowed down the value of x at all. Information's kind of funny that way. right? We've learned something about x, but we can't narrow down x at all. Now we can learn this thing, too. Here's another fact we might learn about x, that x plus 2y minus z is equal to 5. Now we have two facts about x, but if you remember your high school algebra, we have two equations and three unknowns, and so we still can't solve. And in fact, it's still the case that x can take on absolutely any value. And so we've learned two things about x, and yet we cannot narrow down x, the value, actual value of x at all. It could take on any value from minus infinity to positive infinity. So information is kind of funny that way. Now I'm going to tell you another fact, and this fact is that z minus y is equal to 1. Well, now we have three equations and three unknowns, and I'm going to be a polite speaker here and just tell you that the answer to these equations is this. With three equations and three unknowns, we can solve, and if you do the high school algebra work, what you get is this. x is 4, y is 2, and z is 3. And so now we know exactly what x is. We went from a state of not being able to narrow down the value of x at all to a state of knowing exactly what the value of x is. And what is the crucial fact that unlocked the value of x for us? It's that third equation, z minus y equals 1. Now what's weird about this is this equation isn't even about x. There's no x in here. This is a, this is a statement about the relationship between two totally other things, z and y. And yet somehow this was the crucial fact that allowed us to unlock the value of x. Now that's the analogy, but in real life, if we think about inference of facts about people, it is the case that a fact about the relationship between two totally separate people might be the key fact that allows someone to make a precise inference about you. So it's not enough even to say that I'm going to limit the flow of information about me if I want to keep someone from making inferences about me. Because information about other people or the relationship among other people may be the key thing that allows an inference to be unlocked. Surprising inferences crop up all the time when we dig into the details of how people make inferences about information. So let me give you some examples in practice of the kind of inferences that have been made about people from information that might on the surface seem to be entirely private. A good example of this is the AOL search data. AOL, America Online, a big internet company, um, a, a few years back decided um, for, to release in the public interest, for, for good public spirited reasons, to release information about what uh, phrases their users had searched on in the past. But they took care to anonymize the data, to make it anonymized. And the way they did that is they took the search records of every individual and they replaced that individual's name with a totally random number, something like, say, 4417749, just some random number that they made up and assigned to that user. And because they took away the identifying information, they figured that they, wouldn't, uh, that they were hiding who these particular people are, were, and therefore not revealing private information about who had searched for which search information. All right, well, AOL did this. They released this data, and researchers jumped on it pretty quickly. And what they found is that you can, in fact, identify who a person is by what they searched for. Here is user 4417749 in AOL's data, Thelma Arnold, a, a woman, 60-year-old woman who lived in um, Lilburn, Georgia. Here she is with her dog. And here's a bunch of searches she did. Um, 60 single men, dog that urinates on everything, landscapers in Lilburn, Georgia, homes sold in Shadow Lake subdivision. So you look at this and you say, well, maybe she lives in Lilburn, Georgia. Maybe she lives in the Shadow Lake subdivision. Maybe she's looking to sell her home. Maybe she's in her 60s. Um, and you get a picture of who this person is. Well, some New York Times reporters took the information in Mrs. Arnold's searches, or 
um, user said 4417749 searches, they identified who it was. They called this woman up and she said, my goodness, it's my whole personal life revealed in that search data. Turns out to be very revealing because she searched for a bunch of other things. T for good health, termites, numb fingers, hand tremors, dry mouth, bipolar. Um, you might make any number of inferences from that. It turns out most of these were about her friends and family, but nonetheless, you can see how this gets very quickly to sensitive information about an individual. AOL thought they were releasing anonymized data because it didn't have personal information. And yet it turned out to be possible to find information about all kinds of people. And Mrs. Arnold was far from the, uh, was the, was far from the person who revealed the most sensitive information in her searches. Another example comes from a now famous New York Times Magazine article from a couple years ago about the retailer Target. And this article told, and this was uh, recounted in the book, um, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, which is, uh, appeared a, a, a year or two ago. Um, uh, this tells the story of a statistician named Andrew Pohl who worked for Target. Um, and it said when Andrew Pohl had started working at Target, two colleagues came to him and they started, and they asked him, if we wanted to figure out if a customer is pregnant, even if she didn't want us to know, can you do that? Can you do that using information that Target as a retailer has? So what information do they have? Well, what the information they have is basically what these people bought. And so uh, the answer to this question is not so obvious, but with all the data that Target had and with the cleverness of Andrew Pohl, he went and looked at that data and he found that uh, crawling through the data, he could identify about 25 products that combined together allowed him to assign each shopper a pregnancy prediction score. He could estimate the due date. So Target could send coupons to very specific stages of her pregnancy. How did they do that? Well, here's an example that um, when a woman is pregnant, she might change from scented hand lotion to unscented lotion because she wants to put fewer chemicals on her body. That makes sense, right? That's a specific change that is correlated with pregnancy. And of course, pregnancy causes physiological changes which changes the types of, of health products that, that someone will buy. And the result is even before she's buying diapers and cribs and baby stuff, it may become evident from what she's purchased that she might be pregnant. A relatively sensitive fact deduced from what kind of hand lotion she bought. Uh, and this is what we're talking about when people talk about big data and the problem of inference from big data. There are surprising inferences that are possible and something as seemingly harmless as a purchase of hand lotion actually might be revealing about a sensitive fact about an individual. Just like that statement about Z and Y, which seemed harmless in um, revealing the value of X, turned out to be the key to unlocking that inference. One purchase of hand lotion or some other seemingly innocent product might be the factor that unlocks an inference that a particular person is pregnant. So we have inferences from behavior. We also have uh, studies of inferences from relationships. Here's a famous graph that, um, uh, that's a little bit hard to read, but, I'll, but I'll, I will uh, describe it to you. Uh, this is a graph that shows a bunch of colored squares, and each one of the colored squares is one of the 9-11 hijackers. Um, each one of the colored squares, and which color it is um, uh, corresponds to which airplane they were on. The gray squares are people who were not directly involved in the hijackings, meaning they were not on those planes. And every link here is some kind of a relationship between individuals. They lived together, they shared a bank account, one of them gave money to the other, they talked on the phone, some kind of relationship. So looking at this graph, you can start to see patterns of relationship. And in particular, analysts looking, analysts looking at this uh, recognize this particular guy up here, Ramzi bin al Sheib, who seemed to be connected to a lot of the hijackers. Here's a picture of him in Guantanamo. Ramzi bin al Sheib, it turns out, um, was meant to be the 20th 9-11 hijacker. Uh, but for reasons that don't need to concern us here, he was unable to actually participate in the plot. And yet he was perhaps identified by this kind of network analysis, inferring from relationships with other people that he might be central or involved in the 9-11 conspiracy because he's here in the graph and connected to so many of the involved people. And so we have this possibility of making inferences from relationships about people. 
But let's talk about another inference from a relationship. Let's talk about the social network of people involved in WikiLeaks, this organization which has been involved in leaking many um, classified US government documents. WikiLeaks, of course, is, um, uh, is run and headed by this guy, Julian Assange, who is a, a, who's wanted by, by the US government, currently hiding out in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Um, and Julian Assange, we can put him as a dot on this particular graph. And we can connect him to two people who I'll call A and B. And I want to emphasize A and B are known people, and I know who their names are, but I'm choosing not to identify them to you. But A and B are people who, I know, who we know have relationships with uh, Julian Assange, and A and B have relationships with C, and C and D have relationships with D. Again, these are known people who I'm choosing not to name. And all these people, A, B, C, and D, have a relationship with this person E. Okay, so look at this graph and you might say to yourself, gee, it sure looks like this person E has something to, look, to do with WikiLeaks uh, and maybe we ought to investigate this person. But it turns out person E has nothing to do with WikiLeaks and I know that because person E is me. <laughs> I happen to know a bunch of people who, who know Julian Assange. Um, and uh, even though I have nothing to do with WikiLeaks and an investigation of me, trust me, would be a pointless, um, an attempt to build a kind of social network around WikiLeaks might identify me as a person of interest. So these methods don't necessarily work um, with absolute reliability. Nonetheless, we see increased use of inference in law enforcement and in intelligence to try to figure out who might be a person of interest. So many of these inferences that we see in practice, the inferences made by Target about pregnancy, the inferences made by intelligence agencies, based on relationships are probabilistic inferences. That is, they're inferences that aren't certain, but they amount to some kind of idea that it's more likely that a woman is pregnant. It's more likely that this person is involved in WikiLeaks than we might have otherwise thought. And so inferences are often probabilistic, and that's a fancy way of saying that they're not certain, that in fact they're often wrong. And so we face some pretty serious public policy issues, which we're just starting to uh, chew on as um, as, uh, as a society uh, around the fact that these inferences, although very powerful, are maybe not as precise as we'd like them to be. They're sometimes going to be wrong. Now, probabilistic inferences, of course, are very powerful. They're very important in medicine. We know, for example, a probabilistic inference that smoking makes it more likely that you get cancer and therefore, um, or that eating certain kinds of foods or, or exercising or not doing this or doing that make it more likely that you get some medical condition, those sorts of probabilistic inferences are central to medicine and to public health. Um, and that leads us to a pattern of behavior that's something like this, where we, what we'd like is to be able to make an inference about the population of people. But, but uh, we want to do that by taking data about individuals. So, I think it's safe to say that we're happy making inferences about the population, that on average across the population that doing this thing makes you healthier, doing that thing increases the risk that you get in a car accident, and so on. Um, and we, we prefer to make inferences about the population generally, but we're skittish about making inferences about individuals. So you might think that this is a fundamental problem, that in order to make inferences about the population, you have to make inferences about the individual, but that turns out not to be the case. There are clever methods that we can use to make inferences about population without making inferences about individuals. And to explain how that might be, I want to use an example that, um, um, that my students love, and hopefully you will too, and that is the uh, desire to infer how many people have a Justin Bieber tattoo. <laughs> okay, so let's say we wanted to know how many people in this room have a Justin Bieber tattoo. One way I could do it is I could say, raise your hand if you have a Justin Bieber tattoo. But that method might not work, right? Because all of you who have Justin Bieber tattoos might be embarrassed and you might not raise your hand. Or maybe, I don't know, I don't know, the, I don't know um, uh, this Kansas City crowd, but maybe those who don't have Justin Bieber tattoos would claim to have one to be cool. Uh, but regardless, <laughs> we might not get a truthful answer. So how could we find out what fraction of people in a particular group have Justin Bieber tattoos but without finding out whether any individual has a Justin Bieber tattoo. Well, one way we can do that involves the use of randomness. We can flip some coins. And in particular, we can do an experiment that goes something like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell everybody 
um, hypothetically, to flip two coins. And we're going to ask you to put yourself in one of four boxes. So you're going to be in this column if you have a Bieber tattoo and in that column if you don't. And you're going to be in this row if both of your coin flips came up heads. And you're going to be in this row if something else happened, if you got both tails or one head and one tail. Okay, so everyone's going to put themselves in one of these boxes. And then I'm going to say, if you're in one of these two boxes, raise your hand. And we'll count how many people raise their hand. And it turns out we'll be able to infer from that how many people have Justin Bieber tattoos. So why does that work? Well, let's think about this. Well, so let's suppose, hypothetically, that is probably not true, that nobody in this audience has a Justin Bieber tattoo. <laughs> so now we know that there's going to be zero people in these boxes. There's no Bieber tattoos. And we know that, let's say that there's 1,000 people in the group, um, that we know that about a quarter of them will flip heads two times, because that's the way coin flips work, right? With two coins, your probability of getting two heads is about one in four. So out of 1,000 people, we'll have about 250 who are in this box, they don't have a Bieber tattoo, but got two heads, and about 750 who are here. OK, now when I ask people to raise their hands according to my experiment, um, the people in these starred boxes will raise their hands. That's 250 hands that go up. And so if I do this experiment in an audience of 1,000 people and 250 hands go up, we can infer that probably either no people in that audience have Justin Bieber tattoos or very few. If, on the other hand, let's say 100 people out of the 1,000 have Justin Bieber tattoos, now the numbers look something like this. That we have 100 people here in this column, about 25 there and 75 there. We have 900 in this column, and they split up 1 fourth and 3 fourths there. Um, and so when we ask people to raise their hands, if they're in the starred boxes, we'll get about 300 people. So with no Justin Bieber tattoos, we got 250 hands up. With 100 Justin Bieber tattoos, we got 300 hands up. More hands if there are more tattoos. And you can just set up an equation and solve it. It turns out that every hand that goes up means another tw uh, four people with a, uh, with a Bieber tattoo. Um, the English majors, can you actually that? Sure, let me go back and do that again. <laughs> OK, thank you. All right, let's go back. So here's scenario number one. Scenario number one is nobody has a Bieber tattoo, right? And these are the numbers of people out of 1,000 who are in the four boxes. Nobody's in this column with Bieber tattoos. And without Bieber tattoos, I'm sorry. Oh, other. So these are people, I see, these are people who get heads both times. They flip two coins and they get heads on both coins. And these are people who get any other result. They get two tails or they get a head and a tail. Okay, got it. Got it? All right, good. OK. So three quarters of the people are going to be in the other category on average, and one quarter are going to be in the heads and heads category. Right? So with no Bieber tattoos, about 250 hands go up. With 100 Bieber tattoos, about 300 hands go up. With 200 Bieber tattoos, 350 hands would go up. So tell me how many hands went up. I'll tell you roughly how many Bieber tattoos there were. But here's the interesting thing. In this scenario, of the people who raised their hands, most of them are up here. Most of the people who raised their hands, in fact, do not have, in fact, do not have a Bieber tattoo. So if you raised your hands, it's, you're not outing yourself as a person with a Bieber tattoo. You have plausible deniability. <laughs> And so without outing any particular person as having a Bieber tattoo, or not having a Bieber tattoo, we can actually get an estimate of how many people have a Bieber tattoo. We can get information about the population without getting information about individuals. We learned about the group. We didn't learn about individuals. That's a little bit counterintuitive that you can do that. You can poll a group and get an answer from every person and learn about the group as a whole, not without learning about individuals. But that's the kind of thing that's possible by using sophisticated methods. How did we do that? Well, the big, the sort of rough way that we did that is we asked people to answer, and we asked them for an answer which consisted of the truth plus some kind of structured noise. That is, we asked them to lie, but in a way that was determined in a particular mathematical way. And if we structure those lies in just the right way, 
we can uh, arrange them to give plausible deniability while making the lies sort of cancel out when we account, when we add everything up across the whole population. And there's in fact an emerging theory about how we can learn about a population without learning about individuals. And so although we might worry about inference, we might worry about how much information is leaking out about us because of all the information that's collected and that's available publicly. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, it turns out that the benefits of this big data society, the idea that we want to be able to learn about public health, we want to be able to learn about human behavior across the whole population, so as to give people useful advice, such as don't get a Bieber tattoo, um, <laughs> we can actually provide that advice to people in the population without needing to intrude so much on the privacy of individuals. Uh, and so a lot comes down to how careful we are about the details of how we do this. Now, not long after watching All the President's Men with my daughter, I sat down to watch another movie, The Dark Knight Rises, which was at the time the latest installment in the Batman movie series. One of the characters in The Dark Knight Rises is Selina Kyle, whose, um, whose alter ego is Catwoman. And her, um, her motivation in the movie is that she is seeking a particular chip called the clean slate. The clean slate is some kind of magic chip which will reach out into the world and it will claw back all of the data that's been revealed about you and erase it. It will reach out and it will figure out all the inferences that have been made about you and it will undo them, erase them, put you back to a state that existed before this information revolution. So that if someone asks the question, who is Selena Kyle, the answer will be very difficult to get. Now that, of course, is fiction. There's no going back to the world of all the president's men, the world in which finding information about an individual is fundamentally difficult. Because we live in a world of information abundance, we're going to continue to live in that world. The, our, the world we live in has changed, and the conditions that we have to deal with are not what they were before. And we need to figure out what to do about it. And so the big question that faces us now is how will society adapt to these changes? And this adaptation is something that's going to take all of our lifetimes. And I mean that not just for those like me who are somewhat advanced in years, but I mean it even for the very young people in the audience. It's going to take your lifetime for us to work through how we're going to deal with this change. Because what we've seen in the past with big technological changes is that it takes a long time for society to adapt to them. It takes a long time for all of the effects of a big technological change to be felt. If you look, for example, at the printing press, it took centuries for the effect of the printing press to be felt. The printing press led, for example, to the mass production of Bibles. And that played a key role in the emergence of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, after all, argued that everyone should read the Bible, a, an argument that would not have had any force if Bibles were not widely available. That led to religious wars. It led to political reorganization across Europe. It led to the emergence of the modern notion of separation of church and state but that took centuries. The printing press led to the emergence of scientific journals so that scientists no longer sent individual letters to each other, but they published journals that became available and they became available in libraries, leading to the emergence of the institutions of modern science. But that also took decades to play out. So if the printing press, I'm sorry, it took centuries to play out. If the printing press took centuries to play out, things maybe move faster today, but still, the implications of information abundance will take our lifetimes to work out. It's up to us to think about these issues and to figure out what the trade-offs are and how it is that we're going to adapt to all of this. How will society adapt? Uh, I honestly don't know. There are a lot of people thinking about this issue, but it's not enough for people who are in um, uh, elite universities or people who are in government to think about this. We all need to think about how this affects us and about what the norms and expectations should be in a world in which it's possible to know almost everything about almost everybody. 
we're living in a very unique time today. We are going through one of the major transformations in the human relationship to information. Um, one of the four major transformations that's happened in all of human history. And it's up to us to get this figured out. So um, my plea to you is let's get to work. Let's figure this out. Let's talk about how we as a society can live in this world. Because it's happening to us whether we like it or not. And we have to figure this out. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Please raise your hand so we can get the microphone to you. And I'll come by with the microphone. We're videotaping and live streaming this uh, lecture to our worldwide audience. So raise your hand. I'll come by with the microphone. People with Bieber tattoos to the front of the line. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh. We're at. You can oh, cover up Dr. your Spock. Bieber tattoo, though. <laughs> You know, as I was listening to your talk, and I've thought about this before, trying to achieve security of the data uh, prob is probably almost in, uh, impossible by the techniques as an ignoramus like me understands. But I'm wondering, you know, drawing upon nature, when, people, when nature tries to uh, become secure, it uses camouflage. Mm -hmm. And whether in the process of looking at security, you try to make the noise so high that they can't pull out data and whether you can achieve that or not. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. It's the, so the question, right. So can you use camouflage to protect yourself? Um, and I think the answer is yes and no. Um, but let me explain. Yes and no is a terrible answer, but let, maybe, maybe it's better if I explain. Um, that on the one hand, it is possible in principle to behave in a public setting in a way that hides, obfuscates, or uh, just holds very close to the vest all of the information you have about who you are and what you're doing. Uh, on the other hand, it's very difficult to do that when you're involved in ordinary social and business interactions. Right? When you're walking around on the street, your face can be photographed. And yes, you could cover it with a mask, you could make a map of where all the cameras are on the street and not walk there, but it's very difficult to do. Um, I think the practical difficulty with protecting your information in everyday settings and interactions um, is insurmountable for most people. Um, nonetheless, it is useful to try to figure out ways in which we can do this. Uh, and there are some either social understandings or technological mechanisms we can use to have a way to ask. A lot of the way that we negotiate these sorts of um, uh, uh, understandings about the use of information in social settings is informal. We have an expectation about when it's okay to take a person's picture, for example, and when it's not. And it's not technically enforced. It's not always legally enforced, but we kind of have an understanding about that. Um, and so I think there are ways that we can help to develop better understandings and make it easier for people to express their desire to not have information collected. But I think to um, adopt strong camouflage all the time when we're behaving in public is very difficult to do. Yes, sir. Um, so I'm going to offer a little anecdote to add on to one of the examples you gave. Okay. In 2007, I worked for AOL, mm -hmm. and I know their search research team very, very well. These are mm -hmm. the, the people who got fired for releasing those logs were all very close friends of mine. I, I, I know them very well. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, and I, you may know this already, that Mrs. Jordan was buying a house. That's why she's searching on termites and where to live and everything. Uh -huh. But the person she was buying it from had the same last name. So she executed ah. searches that had that name. And it created a false positive. But once you see the pattern, mm -hmm. everybody could figure everything else out. So they actually did do very careful scrubbing to anonymize that data. Mm -hmm. But there's a false positive, And then that, it's, it's like having the key to a code. Right, so I think this is, I, I mean, I think this just reinforces this idea that it's so difficult to scrub information in a way that, that, um, that actually prevents inferences from it. But thanks. Yeah, and, and it's absolutely true that 
this, that what the AOL folks did was done with all good intentions um, and done, um, they thought carefully. It's just that they, I think, didn't fully appreciate how difficult the thing they were trying to do actually was. And go ahead, you want to follow up? Sir, let me get this on the. Uh... <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So let me just repeat that for those who uh, who um, uh, who are watching remotely that the uh, the people who uh, uh, were detached from AOL as a result of that uh, ended up starting a separate company, which they sold to Twitter six months later, and they did very 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 nicely. Professor Felton, back here at the yes. very back of the room. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I live in Missouri and, I, and I'm old. And uh, uh, for, when I first got my driver's license, my social security number was my driver's license. Mm -hmm. And of course, every, every, every bill I paid, I paid with a, a check. And everybody wanted my ID. Mm -hmm. So I actually printed my social security number on my check for many years. Yes. So I assumed the horse is out of the barn in terms <laughs> In terms yeah. of security now, and I just kind of like give it like I, I teach and I tell my students the the the, the my control of the classroom is an illusion because if they really wanted to take it over they could you know <laughs> so I assume that security is just an illusion at least in my part so I just was wondering if you had any suggestions for me or if I'm <laughs> if I'm if I'm delusional or if I'm correct. So, well, it, it's it, it's tough to get security. Uh, I think I think this the um, the history of social security numbers is kind of instructive, right? It was initially meant, and in fact, the initial law that established the social security number said that it was just to be used by the social security administration for a particular and employers for a particular purpose. But the assignment of a unique ID, ID number to almost every American turned out to be an irresistible draw for businesses that wanted to have unique identifiers that let them compare and merge their records so that business A had a record about a person and business B had a record about a person. If they wanted to correlate those and know that they really were the same person, that a really useful way to do that is to include the social security number in both. So almost any unique identifier um, takes on that role. And now that social security numbers are not used so much for that purpose, now it's the mobile phone number, which is becoming the new social security number, which is becoming the unique identifier. The other thing I'd say about that is that um, those of us who teach computer security always tell our students, don't use the same information to identify a person and to authenticate them. That is, don't use the same, that the information you use as an identifier should not be a secret that they use to prove that they are who they say they are. But that's exactly what the social security number conventionally is. It's both used, used ubiquitously to identify you, but also knowledge of the social security number is taken as proof that you are that person. And that's a very dangerous combination. And much of what we call identity theft is possible because we use the same identifier, same information as an identifier and an authenticator. Problem is we don't really have a better approach. Professor Felton, we have a question yes, back sir. here. Um, at some point, could we change privacy, uh, the, the impacts of it by sort of revamping ethics and revamping social norms and revamping acceptance. Mm -hmm. So if, if there are behaviors that are all hidden and private, yeah. um, if we, at, at some point, if we change the fabric of what we are and aren't ashamed of and what we are and aren't hiding, then sure. all of a sudden that, that becomes moot. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have to, given that so much information, especially about the younger generation um, is available. Um, and I think, about, um, I think about politics as far as this goes, right? For example, um, you know, we have had recent presidents who have had experience with drugs and alcohol when they were younger, right? We know that Bill Clinton did. We know that George W. Bush did. We know that Clinton, you know, used marijuana, for example. We know that Bush had troubles with alcohol at one point in his life, um, and they both talked about that, um, but what we didn't have was a photo of them with a joint or glass in their hand. We didn't have a video of them obviously drunk or stoned, right? Um, and so 
we could deal with it in a different way. But with the generation that's coming up now, if they did behave in that way, we would have video, we would see it. And when they ran for office 20, 30 years from now, that would be available. Um, and I think we're going to have a shift in social norms. I think we have to, now that much more is visible. Now, but that only goes so far. Um, because I don't think we can go to the limit of um, full transparency. There's an interesting book by David Brin called The Transparent Society. And he advocates for a world in which everybody can watch everybody else all the time, where nobody has any secrets from anybody. And he says that, look, we're, we're practically going there anyway. We might as well go all the way. And there will be no shame in doing the things that, you know, um, and being seen in the situations that we all, um, you know, are glad we're not seen being and doing. Uh, that's what he says. I find that a little bit hard to accept. Um, you know, we wear clothing in public for a reason. Um, and um, among other things, right? Um, so I think we'll see a shift in norms. I think we'll be more forgiving of especially behavior that's far in the past. But um, nonetheless, I also think it's the case that more and more of us are going to have to start thinking like public figures have historically thought. A person who's a public figure has always had to be careful in public about how they look, about what they say, because one wrong, you know, one wrong word, one inappropriate joke, um, uh, dressing terribly, being seen in public, you know, in look, not looking your best, um, is a problem if you are a public figure, right? And I think aspects of that are going to come into the lives of everybody, where people are, um, are more uh, aware of how what they're doing and saying is going to appear they're editing themselves a little bit. Um, and I think there's a real loss when we all do that. But I think it seems to be a consequence of the world that we live in now. Um, and that's another thing we're going to have to learn to navigate. Professor Felton, back here on your yes, left. Sir. It seems to me that the expectation of privacy uh, varies considerably from individual to individual. Mm -hmm. Your example of the Bieber tattoo might be embarrassing for one person laudatory for another, although it's hard for me to believe that. <laughs> but if that's true, uh, where does the concept of individual uh, and knowledgeable waiver of privacy, where does that play in uh, with, with, this, uh, with this discussion? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, I think one of, the, one of the principles that we immediately go to in thinking about law and policy for privacy is the notion of consent by an individual. And that a person who's a competent adult, uh, you know, for in, mo for in most cases, should be able to consent to information being known. Um, but, um, but I think in practice, um, what people often want to do with this kind of information is reveal it in some settings and not in others. People who have tattoos, for example, um, will sometimes cover them in the workplace but might uncover them if they're going out in a social setting with people, um, with a different population of people. Um, one, of the way, one of the things we know about the way that young people, for example, use social media sites like Facebook, um, is that they will try to construct different images, different behaviors that are visible with their friends versus with their parents. Right? There's nothing new about teenagers behaving differently around their parents than around their friends. Um, and in fact, all of us behave differently depending on which, um, which of our social circles we're in. Um, and one of the things that gets eroded is the ability to selectively um, reveal or not reveal information. Um, and I think that is a difficult thing to deal with. Um, there's been some people who, who study this talk about the importance of context and that really the, the uh, philosopher Helen Nissenbaum says that the real, the real problem with privacy is information which is appropriate in one context that leaks over into another context where it's not appropriate or where it's not desired. Um, and I think that's a useful way of thinking about all of this, that people want, certainly we want to be able to give people the ability to reveal information when they want to, but they also want to say, I'm going to reveal it to my friends, I'm going to reveal it to my family, I don't want to reveal it to my boss, or whatever. Professor Felton, up here on your right. Yes. Uh, due to the time, well, let's take two more questions. 
Thank you, Professor Felton. Um, can you consider this um, maybe from a public policy perspective? Um, you, as you said earlier, the proliferation of big data yes. will go un unabated for the years to come. What about this trend towards business enterprises monetizing on the growth of big data, whether it's private or personal or public? Sure. Is that a good thing or not? Um, that's really hard, and that's actually, this goes right to the issues that I worked on, for example, when I was at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, that businesses make a lot of use of data, and many of those uses of data are things that we as consumers would appreciate. For example, the ability of a business to do an instant credit check and um, sell something to us, or um, uh, for example, the, just the fact that you can walk into, let's say, a mobile phone store and walk out with a phone and a contract. That's because they can do an instant credit check on you, and that's because of information that's collected and credit scoring and all of that stuff. And so often as consumers, this is something we want, um, or something that we are willing to agree to in exchange for something of value that we get. Um, and that's fine. But where this becomes difficult is when the collection of data and the uses of data get so complicated and so difficult to see and understand for the consumer that they're not really in a position to make an informed choice. Um, and so to me, a lot of this is about transparency, about making sure that people are empowered to make decisions about whether they want to trade some privacy away in exchange for some benefit or not. And, but in order to make that choice effectively, people need to know what they're trading away and what they're getting. And often today, that's not the case. Often today, there's some pretty words about we value your privacy but what there isn't is um, concrete information about what's going to happen if you do this thing. We have a question here about midway okay. back on your left. Mm -hmm. And due to the time, this will have to be the last question. Great. As a practical matter, what would you suggest for us? Like avoid social media, um, use cash whenever possible, don't use credit cards, mm -hmm. tear up all the loyalty cards and pay more at the grocery store or wherever because they're collecting data on you. Uh, what can we do to minimize the impact? Obviously, sure. we, we can't totally eliminate it, mm -hmm. but what, what practical steps can we take to protect our privacy? So here, here's what I would say. First, in a social media setting, um, you should think of a social media setting as at least semi-public. Um, you can have an illusion that you're only talking to a few friends in that setting, but I think that's dangerous. And you should think of it as, um, uh, you know, I think of it, if I would say, I would not say anything on social media that I wouldn't say in front of this room. Um, and uh, that's, so it is at least semi-public. Um, with respect to what you do in the commercial setting, I think most everyday activities, for most people, it's okay to behave in a straightforward way. Um, you might want to think about buying certain things with cash if um, they would enable, let's say, a negative inference about your health or your credit worthiness or something. Um, um, I buy certain health-related products with cash, as an example. Um, it's very difficult, though, to give up the conveniences of modern life and the modern economy. Um, and, and I think you have to think a little bit when you're in an online setting or when you're engaged in public transactions, you have to think a little bit like that public figure, that there is a chance that the information that you're disclosing will get used in a way that, um, uh, will get used in a way that you don't anticipate. Um, and therefore, if what you're doing is especially sensitive or you think that it could be embarrassing or, da or damaging if used in the wrong setting, then you can think about taking a little bit of extra precaution, buying cash or, or talking to somebody in person rather than, um, rather than in a social network or something like that. Um, I think, th unfortunately, there's not a strong answer, you should do this thing, you'll be protected. Um, right now, I think it's mostly about identifying those few cases where we really do want to protect something and then taking a little bit of extra precaution by backing off into the old-fashioned analog world, cash and face-to-face. -face. Right. Thank everybody. you, Professor Feldman.
I know there were a few hands up. Uh, I think Professor Felton's going to stick around for a few minutes, but sure. he does have another event he has to get to. Mm -hmm. But thank you for attending tonight's lecture. Please pick up a flyer on the reference desk. We have some great programs coming up later this month. Thank you and good night. <laughs>